Thomas began to regain consciousness, but couldn't understand where he was, in this world or the next. There was something in his mouth that prevented him from swallowing. His eyes felt like they were filled with sand, and his eyelids were so heavy that they could hardly open. Bright light shone into his eyes, and everything around him was white. Maybe I'm already dead and in paradise, the man thought to himself. Everything is so quiet. But then, why can't I wake up? And I don't feel my body at all. Suddenly, he saw a young girl leaning over him, asking, How do you feel? Can you hear me? Blink if yes. Thomas managed not only to blink, but also to murmur something like, Yes. The girl clicked something, and people around him began to fuss, pulling out the tube from his mouth and turning off the sensors that covered his entire body. The man breathed a sigh of relief and thought, Phew! So, I'm alive! A grey-haired doctor in a funny cap came in, examined the patient and smiled. Well, Thomas, everything is going according to plan, and you have awakened. The operation was more than successful, although it lasted six hours. There were many concerns, as in such cases, the risk of rejection of a foreign organ is very high. But you were lucky. The donor's heart took root in you, as if it were your own. It's hard to believe such success. Consider today your second birthday. Now you will live for another hundred years. The man weakly smiled and thanked the doctor for his golden hands, and asked about his donor. Unfortunately, I have no right to divulge such confidential information, answered the doctor. And don't ask me such questions again. It's not ethical. Be glad that you survived. Now everything will go well. You still have a period of rehabilitation, but meanwhile, you rest. I'll come and see you later. Thomas put his hand on his chest and listened. His new heart was beating like his own. There was a strange and disturbing feeling inside Thomas, because he was alive now, and someone had died, and a part of that person was now in him. He wondered if his character would change now, or if new habits would appear. And who was his donor? A man or a woman? How old were they? How did they live? They were no longer a stranger to him. Suddenly, Thomas remembered his daughter Jenny, and tears welled up in his eyes. He terribly missed his six-year-old daughter, even though he understood that she was with her grandmother in safe hands. He wanted to hug his little girl, breathe in the smell of childhood, and kiss her beloved, fragrant cheeks. Memories of his youth rolled over him involuntarily, and his whole life flashed before his eyes. Thomas grew up in a wealthy family. His father had his shoe repair shop, and his mother had her grocery store. Thomas grew up in abundance, had the best of everything, as he was the only and late child in the family. He graduated from university and started a shoe business, just like his father, but not with repairs, but with sales. He didn't prioritize quantity, but instead focused on quality. Everyone in town knew that his stores had excellent shoes. Business slowly picked up, and soon, Thomas married a wonderful girl, Hope. She was from a simple rural family. His parents were not against such a match, as they themselves came from humble origins, and were sure that such a modest daughter-in-law would be a good mother and homemaker. Hope impressed Thomas with her affectionate smile and huge, sad grey eyes. The newlyweds lived well and almost never quarrelled. Hope tried to please Thomas in everything, and was an ideal wife. But she often fell ill, frequently and for long periods of time. Even a small breeze would give her a cold, and any draughts caused kidney problems. Years passed without the couple being able to have a child. The doctors advised Hope not to have a child due to her fragile health, and Thomas loved her and did not insist. However, Hope had intentionally hidden her pregnancy from everyone, knowing that they would persuade her to terminate it. She wanted so much to become a mother, to finally kiss her baby's cheeks, 
to cradle her little one and give her all her love. When she was taken to the maternity hospital, Thomas was very anxious because a bad, oppressive premonition did not let him rest. He smoked cigarettes and walked back and forth along the hospital corridor, praying as best he could. Nine hours later, he received the news that killed him. Hope died on the operating table without regaining consciousness, but their daughter was miraculously saved. It seemed that Thomas's life was cut short at that moment, and everything faded away. The man was terribly grieved, but he never doubted for a second that he could take care of his daughter. Fortunately, Jenny was calm and not capricious, as if understanding that her father was already burdened. At first, Hope's mother, Helen, helped him take care of the baby. She came from the village for a month and taught her son-in-law all the intricacies of caring for a newborn. And after that, she often arrived to help him at the first call. She was a good woman, no doubt about it. Now Jenny was six years old. Thomas had been complaining about his heart for the last two years. Sometimes he had a sharp pain or a rapid heartbeat. He had shortness of breath, and performing basic household chores became difficult. One day, things became so bad that he was taken to the hospital by ambulance. During an examination, it was discovered that he had inoperable complications with his heart and that he needed an urgent heart transplant. However, the search for a suitable donor often dragged on for months or even years, and many died before the operation could take place. No amount of money in the world could help. Additionally, the business required attention, and Thomas couldn't prioritize. But a month ago, he was hospitalized again and called Helen, who immediately took Jenny to her village, as there was no one else to leave her with. Thomas's condition worsened, and even IVs and supporting medications could not save him. And then, a true miracle happened. He was informed that a donor who was a suitable match had been found and that he was being prepared for emergency surgery. Now that he had regained consciousness, he will live. Everything is still ahead. That other person will never open their eyes again, and only their heart beats and beats, as if constantly reminding of this. Upon discharge, Thomas approached the doctor again and tried to find out the identity of the donor, but he was refused and scolded. Why do you make us commit a crime? It is not allowed to disclose, and that's it. However, this idea firmly settled in Thomas's head and did not let him rest day or night. First of all, when he arrived at his mansion, Thomas called his mother-in-law to make sure that his daughter was okay and talked to her on the phone for a long time. The girl was eager to come home. Daddy, how good it is that you have recovered. When will you come for me? I missed you so much and I want to go home. Grandma is good, of course, but home is still better. The man could barely hold back his tears and persuaded his daughter, Wait a little longer, my little one. Listen to your granny and help her with the household chores. I will get better soon and come to you right away. Agreed? I miss you so much, my little kitten. Then the calls from work began. While Thomas was sick, his deputy, Hugh Flynn, was responsible for the company. He was a good professional, no doubt about it, but not an excellent person. Paul, the leading specialist in procurement, started telling Thomas what had happened in his absence. I'm glad you're feeling better, and I'm looking forward to when you're back at the company, because with Mr. Flynn, we're definitely going to the bottom soon, and my intuition has never let me down. Mr. Flynn almost made a deal to purchase low-quality Chinese material at a throwaway price, twice already. And he wanted to carry it out like it was premium leather. Luckily, I realized in time and didn't sign anything. Otherwise, we would have lost a lot of money for sure. And the other day, I accidentally met him in a cafe. He was talking to our main competitor. What could connect them? It's not good. Please get better as soon as possible, and meanwhile, I'll keep my ears open. Thomas was surprised. It's really strange you didn't tell me anything about it. 
Thank you for the warning. I trust you, Paul. Well, we'll be in touch. The next day, Thomas decided to take a leisurely stroll through the park. The doctor said he needed to walk to accustom his heart gradually to the load. He watched the fallen leaves rustling under his feet, so cheerful and colourful, how the wind rustled and enjoyed the walk. Suddenly, a boy of about seven ran up to him. He was so funny in his blue jumpsuit and crooked hat, clearly not from an affluent family, but clean, and his eyes were so mischievous, with a sparkle. The child handed him a note and shouted, "'This will help you find out the truth!' and quickly disappeared into the bushes before Thomas could even come to his senses from amazement. Thomas didn't understand anything and unfolded a crumpled notebook page. There was an address written on it, 45 Redwood Street. And that was it. It was not understandable from whom or to whom it was addressed. But something about the little boy seemed familiar to Thomas, though he didn't understand why. His heart raced as he made his way to the address, not quite sure why he was going there. The house was small but well kept, with a barking dog in the yard. Thomas knocked on the door, feeling terribly awkward about what he was going to say. He had only been given the address by a boy in the park, so what could he possibly say? It all seemed ridiculous. An elderly woman with a neat, short haircut opened the door. Thomas began to explain, but the woman interrupted him and pulled him into the house, exclaiming, "'Hello, Thomas, my son. You've finally come. I was wondering if you would show up or not. Come in, take off your clothes. I'll put the kettle on the stove now.' Thomas sat down, feeling completely lost. "'Mom, are you crazy?' he asked. "'I'm not your son. I know and remember my parents.' They've already passed away, but you have nothing to do with them, for sure. What are you talking about? I'll probably go. I must have the wrong address. Sorry. The woman started crying. Wait a minute, she begged. Listen to me. Your real brother gave you his heart, whether you understand it or not. And he died three weeks ago. Look, here's his photo. My Duncan. And I am your real mother. My name is Madeline. I gave birth to you and him. You are twins. Do you understand? Thomas blinked repeatedly. Not really, he admitted. I grew up with the Crawford family. They owned a store and a shoe workshop. And now I am a businessman myself, also involved in the shoe business. I have been living with them, growing up for as long as I can remember. There is even a photo of my mother holding me as a baby. How is this possible? The elderly woman began to cry again and then told her story. You see, my son, I am an orphan. I grew up in an orphanage with no relatives in the world. After leaving the orphanage, I worked as a painter on a construction site. I lived in a dormitory. And then we were hired to work on an apartment for a young, handsome, rich man. I was young and inexperienced, so I fell head over heels in love with him. He lured me with sweet words, flowers and candy, and seduced me. But then everything happened, like in a TV series. I became pregnant, and he immediately acted as if he had nothing to do with it and didn't know me. Who was I to him? Just a worker? Not even his equal. I had been hiding my pregnancy until the end even lifting bags of cement at the construction site while carrying twins. Where could I go with two children? I had nowhere to live except the dormitory. I cried, sobbed, didn't know what to do. I even thought about suicide. And then my friend advised me to contact the Crawford family. They were childless and everyone knew it. They really wanted a baby. So I fell at their feet and told them everything. They agreed to take one baby and chose you. They had a lot of money. They processed all the documents confidentially and got me to sign a statement that I would never appear in their family or your life under any pretext. 
they gave me a lot of money. So at least I bought everything necessary for little Duncan. A cot, a stroller and children's clothes. And that's how you, Thomas, ended up with them. I gave you away to strangers with my own hands. Then I often thought of you, cried, but life gradually improved. I got married successfully after a year, but it was too late to regret. So you and your brother lived separately, not knowing about each other. I didn't dare to tell my husband the truth, and he died without knowing anything. He loved Duncan, like his own, never hurt him. Our son was a good guy, kind, responsive and simple. If anyone was in trouble, he would always help. He married a nice girl and worked in a taxi. Three years ago, he decided that after his death, all his organs could be used as donors. It was like he had a feeling. And three weeks ago, he was killed in a car accident. He was exhausted and fell asleep at the wheel. I still can't believe it. I'm waiting for the door to open and Duncan to shout, Mum, I'm home. The elderly woman ended her story and cried bitterly from grief and sadness. Thomas was stunned. I'm sorry for your loss. Losing a son is a terrible sorrow. But who is this boy who gave me a note in the park? Madeline sighed. He's Duncan's son, your nephew. Now he's almost an orphan. I don't know how to tell him. He thinks his daddy went away and will be back soon. He's driving me crazy with questions. It's like a knife to the heart. Thomas was stunned again. And where is the child's mother? Did Duncan have a wife? Madeline cried again. Of course, Barbara was such a good woman. She worked as a bookkeeper in a company. She always worried about her work, often took reports home, thinking they would appreciate her efforts. Instead, her cunning boss set her up, accused her of fraud, and they gave her a five-year sentence. Like she made a phony deal and pocketed all the money. But it's pure slander. Duncan almost attacked her boss with his fists in court. Everyone knew that Barbara was incapable of such things, but nothing could be proven. So now she's languishing in prison for no reason, and she's also seriously ill with tuberculosis. The doctors say it's a severe form, and she doesn't have long to live. Some kind of evil fate has befallen my son's family. Only troubles and disasters. And that scoundrel, her boss, is living it up, driving expensive cars, changing mistresses like gloves, and he doesn't care about anyone but himself. How can such villains exist? Duncan worked three shifts and even drove a taxi at night, like he was crazy. He wanted to earn enough money for a good lawyer to help get Barbara out of prison, but he didn't have time. Thomas couldn't digest so much information at once. He asked directly, How did you find out who received your son's heart? It's confidential information. I asked the chief physician many times, but he refused to discuss it. I have an acquaintance who works at the hospital and she helped me, the elderly woman replied. I begged and pleaded with her until she took pity on me. When I read your name, I felt sick to my stomach. It's unbelievable that one brother gave his heart to another and saved his life without even knowing it. Thomas was shocked by this whole story and after thinking for a while, he asked, So, what do you want from me? Money? But you rejected me, and I'm sorry, but I can't call you my mother. Another woman raised and loved me. Why did you decide to find me now after all these years? Madeline lowered her eyes. Forgive me, my son. Maybe you're right. Of course I shouldn't have started all this. I promised not to interfere in your life. We're strangers, I see that now. I just feel sorry for little Lee. I can't take it any more. Everything has come crashing down. His father died. His mother is dying in prison. I'm getting old, and I'm afraid I won't be able to get my grandson on his feet. So I thought, maybe you could help. After all, he's your nephew. I apologize for bothering you. Goodbye, my son, and forgive me for everything. 
Thomas grumbled. All right, all right, forgive me for being rude. It just slipped out. Did I say I wouldn't help? I just need to think things over. You have to understand I'm still in shock, finding out in one second that my donor is my brother and his wife is on the brink of death and you're my mother. My head is spinning from all of this. Let me collect myself and figure out what to do. I'll find out everything about Lee's mother and I'll let you know. Your son's heart beats in me and I'm forever in debt to him. So don't worry, I won't abandon you. I'll help. Don't doubt it. And we're not strangers at all. I just haven't come to my senses yet. Thomas slept poorly, dreaming of the little boy with mischievous, lively eyes. He was his nephew. What would happen to him now? His grandmother was already old, and everything was unclear with his mother. It's a pity about the boy. I should find out everything tomorrow, not to delay matters. It's strange that my life changed so dramatically after the operation. So many relatives appeared at once. And my mother! Thomas's head was spinning. But now it was clear why the heart had taken root so well. It was almost his own. Oh, Duncan, thank you, brother. Thomas used all his connections and managed to get Barbara's case reviewed. Despite his wild weakness, he went to her company and started questioning her colleagues. He spoke with the new accountant, with the secretary. People like that always know and see more than all the other employees. By paying money, Thomas managed to obtain reports and papers for the period when Barbara allegedly committed fraud. He took them to a handwriting expert who conducted an independent examination, which revealed that someone had skillfully forged Barbara's signature on those very documents. And the secretary revealed that a certain Hugh Flynn had just at that time pulled off a big illegal deal and claimed that he suspected nothing and only a cunning accountant had organised it all to get rich. Thomas was in shock. This was his deputy. It turned out that Hugh was succeeding on all fronts. Now it became clear to Thomas why Hugh could afford such a luxurious car of the latest model and even his own yacht. Even he, Thomas, couldn't afford that since he returned most of the profits to circulation. In a couple of days after speaking with his mother, Thomas found the investigator the most meticulous to details and incorruptible and soon the gears started turning. The case was reviewed and Barbara was found innocent. All charges were dropped and she was released. But it was too late. Barbara was almost dying, and they immediately transferred her from the prison hospital to the intensive care unit of the TB dispensary. Although the best doctors took care of her, nothing could be done anymore. Tuberculosis had completely affected her lungs, and she coughed up blood almost every half hour. Barbara could hardly get up and had a fever. Thomas was not allowed to see her because the disease is extremely contagious, but they handed him her farewell note. Thomas brought it to Madeline. Fortunately, Lee was at school. They sat in the kitchen, unfolded the sheet with trembling hands and began to read. Thomas, I don't know you personally, but I've heard that it was you who took care of and did all the impossible freeing me from prison. It's a pity it's too late, but still I am immensely grateful to you for ensuring that my son will not grow up with the stigma of a convict mother. Because I am not guilty of anything, it was all done by Mr. Flynn. He supervised our company, and I became only a pawn and a change coin in their dishonest game. I swear on my son's health, I didn't sign anything. I'm not crazy. It's all a forgery. I repeated this a hundred times in court, but it was like they didn't hear me. I wish these people to experience everything I went through in these walls in their own skin. And you, Thomas, I beg you, on my knees, I implore you, don't leave your nephew and my little son. 
My mother-in-law is an excellent woman, but she is already old. It will be very difficult for her to raise her grandson alone. After all, my Duncan is not in this world either. One thing comforts me. We will see each other soon with him there in heaven. Bury me next to my husband. It's critical to me. Lee, Mummy loves you very much. You should always remember that. Listen to Grandma and Uncle Thomas. They are your closest and dearest. And I will watch over you and take care of you from heaven. I hug you so much. My sweetest baby. They both wept. Madeline sobbed, and Thomas swallowed his tears silently. Why is everything so unfair in life? whispered Thomas finally. Why can't anything be done? Why should Lee be left alone without a mother who loves him so much? Just like my daughter, Jenny. Why do children have to suffer so much? Madeline asked quietly. Do you have a daughter? You didn't mention her son. Would you mind if we meet her? She's with my mother-in-law in the village, Thomas replied. I took her there when things got terrible for me. I'll have to pick her up soon because she misses me so much. My wife died during childbirth, so it's just me and my daughter. She's the most important thing in my life. Why should I be against communication? We're a family after all. The next day, Barbara died in the hospital. Thomas ensured that the woman had a dignified farewell. Madeline insisted that Lee should be told about his mother's death. But Thomas strongly disagreed. This is wrong. Give your grandson the opportunity to say goodbye to his mother. He needs to understand and accept this. Otherwise, he won't forgive either of us for this betrayal and lie. And he needs to be told about his father's death. I don't know how to do it, but it needs to be done. After all, parents won't come back or be resurrected, and the child will live with false hopes. And can you imagine how he'll feel later when he finds out he was fooled and lied to? Softly as best he could, Thomas tried to explain to Lee what had happened. He told the child that his parents were now in heaven, like angels watching over him and loving him, but he couldn't see them. Inside, however, Thomas was breaking down, a lump in his throat, and his brother's heart beat faster in his chest, as if supporting him in this difficult conversation. But you know, Lee, I'm your real uncle, and Madeline, your grandmother, will always be there for you. You're not alone. We're together, understand? You need to be a man, be strong, hold on, but now, cry. Sit next to your mummy. That's what you need to do. Later, when you grow up, you'll remember this sad moment as the most important in your life. Besides, I have a daughter, Jenny. She also lost her mummy, and she misses her too. But together we cope, and you will too. Come here, my little nephew. Let me hug you. The boy trustingly snuggled up to Thomas, and it warmed his heart as if he had hugged his own son. The child cried bitterly and sat quietly by his mother's coffin for a long time, telling her something as if she could hear him. Meanwhile, Thomas had already decided that he would take Lee home with him. He felt a tremendous responsibility for the boy's fate. A week after Barbara's funeral, Thomas went to the village for his daughter. Jenny, seeing her father, immediately wanted to jump on his neck. But Thomas just groaned and sat down, kissing, hugging, and stroking her curly, long locks. In the village, Jenny looked like a mischievous little boy, in ridiculous pants and an oversized jacket, all dirty, but happy and tanned. The man laughed heartedly and said, My dear daughter, you look like a chimney sweep. Where's my little princess? Who's this little gnome? Come on, clean up, wash your face, change your clothes, and let's go. Then Thomas turned to his mother-in-law. Thank you for looking after her. Did she misbehave too much? Please forgive me for not picking her up earlier. I was still weak after the surgery, and everything happened so fast. My head is still spinning. The elderly woman laughed. 
Oh, come on, Tommy. My granddaughter brings me nothing but joy. She makes everything more fun, and time flies by. Look how rosy her cheeks are from the fresh air. You brought her to me from the city like a wilted flower, but she's shining. We get along well. She's a good girl, clever. How about you? Thank God everything ended well. I prayed so much to God, begging him not to take my son-in-law away from my daughter too early. She's already without her mother, and I don't want her to end up an orphan. Don't just stand there. Come and sit at the table. I'll feed you, and take my homemade treats with you. Milk, sausage, strawberry jam. Thomas was eating potatoes, pickled mushrooms with sauerkraut, and praising everything. Oh, you're the best. You're a wonderful woman. Thank you for everything. I wanted to talk to you about something. So much has happened in my life in the past months. My head is spinning. Listen to everything and give me advice on what I should do, according to your conscience. And the man told his mother-in-law everything about how his mother found him, about his brother, and his nephew. Wanting to adopt the boy is a noble thing. I approve of it. Just don't rush it. Let the children get used to each other. Bring the boy over for visits first. And as for your mother, don't be angry with her, Tommy. You can't change the past. It's her sin. Let her live with it. It's not up to you or me to judge. She probably couldn't do any different at the time when she made that decision. But you weren't mistreated. She didn't put you in an orphanage. She placed you with a good, wealthy family. I remember your parents very well. They were wonderful, honourable people who adored you. You weren't deprived of love. So what's wrong? Since she found you herself, it means she's not doing well. She misses you. Don't push her away. Support her. Try to understand and forgive her, and accept everything as it is. Thomas brightened up. Thank you for your wise advice and for the delicious dinner. Well, let's go with my daughter. The journey is not short. They said warm goodbyes, and Thomas took his daughter home. Jenny was happy, chattering all the way and entertaining her father with stories about her adventures in the village. A few days later, Thomas invited Lee and his grandmother to visit his home. He was worried about how Jenny would react to the boy, if she would be jealous, and his nephew might feel uncomfortable in a strange house. The man prepared carefully, bought and cooked a turkey in the oven, and prepared gifts and sweets for the children. At first, the little boy was a little shy, but Jenny quickly cheered him up. The kids became friends and began enthusiastically assembling jigsaw puzzles, racing around the house, and playing hide and seek. For the first time since the funeral, Lee must have been laughing, and he was at least a little oblivious. Thomas breathed a sigh of relief. While the children were having fun, the man had a long and quiet conversation with his real mother. She told him about his brother, how he grew up, how he met his first love, and how he was looking forward to seeing his son in the world. Thomas showed his mother his childhood photos and photos of his wife. He expressed how bad he felt without her and how hard it was to bring up his daughter alone. No matter how you look at it. The girl still lacked a mother's hand and motherly caress. Towards the end of the evening, the owner of the house decided to delight the children with a surprise. He shouted, "Kids, come here! I have a surprise for you. Here, I'm giving you both roller skates, and I suggest that on Sunday we go to the park to learn to skate." There was a squeal of joy, and Jenny and Lee rushed to unpack the gifts. The happiness was boundless. Madeline just threw up her hands. Thomas, it's such an expensive gift. Thank you. You will spoil my grandson, and then what will I do with him, on my pension? You won't have to raise Lee on your own, answered Thomas. I was thinking, why don't you come and live with me for good? What's the point of being lonely together? It'll be more fun for me and Jenny. And it would be easier for me. I am always at work, and before I had to get out and hire a nanny for a few hours. 
so that my daughter was not alone at home until I returned. This way, you'll look after her. So think about my offer until the weekend, okay? We're family now, aren't we, Mom? I'm not angry, and I'm not offended. We have to move on. Madeline was taken aback. Thank you, son, for your kind soul, but it's embarrassing a little. I, I don't even know. Lee, do you want to live with Uncle Thomas and Jenny? The boy nodded his head with joy. Yes, I like it here, and Jenny will be my little sister. That's great. Madeline breathed out a sigh of relief and said, All right then, let's try it. My grandson doesn't mind, and for me, it's only happiness to live under one roof with my son and grandson. So, on the weekend, we'll move. Thomas quietly watched Jenny's reaction. She suddenly frowned and pressed her lips. This strained the man. Apparently, the fitting of characters was ahead. After all, the daughter was used to all Daddy's love, and his time only for her and now some brother showed up, and the grandmother, about whom the girl had never known. But said and done, Thomas was not used to throwing words to the wind, and soon they all began to live together. Strangely enough, he and his mother got along just fine. Apparently, there was still a kindred thread between them. However thin and invisible, which tied them together. But the kids often fought. Jenny was very jealous of Lee for his father. As soon as he climbed into the arms of Thomas, she immediately climbed up there hysterically. She followed Thomas, not giving Lee any chance to capture her father's attention. Then the girl began to share the toys into yours and mine. Lee became sad again, feeling left out. The situation was heating up, and then Thomas decided to take drastic measures. Jenny was a stubborn and jealous girl, but she was also very responsive and honest. Thomas knew this about her, and one day he took both kids by the hand and said, Get in the car. Today will be a sad but essential day for both of you. It's time to grow up. Let's go. He said it so sternly that the kids fell silent and didn't say a word the whole way. They arrived at the cemetery. Thomas brought both children to his wife's grave and began, Look, Lee, Jenny's mum and my wife are buried here. Now tell me, daughter. Are you happy without your mum? Don't you want her to be nearby to hug and caress you? It's sad when everyone in school has a mum, but you don't, right? I'm right, aren't I? Jenny lowered her head. Yes, Dad, it's true. Even though I love you very much more than anything in the world, I miss my mummy. Lee was watching everything silently and with obvious confusion. Meanwhile, Thomas said to the children, Get back in the car. This isn't all yet. Don't ask anything. You'll understand everything soon. The man drove the children to another cemetery. They got out and he brought them to the fresh graves of Barbara and Duncan. He spoke sternly to his daughter. Here, Jenny, is where Lee's mum and dad are buried. His parents died just a month ago. You have me, but Lee doesn't have anyone. Do you understand? You behave stupidly and cruelly when you throw tantrums and get jealous. Think about how your brother feels. And remember, you two are siblings. You must always stick together, no matter what happens. Support, love, and respect each other. I love you both equally and will always be there for you. Now I am one dad for both of you. Clear? Lee couldn't hold back and burst into tears, remembering his mum and dad, while Jenny suddenly hugged him tightly and whispered, I understand everything. Forgive me. I won't do it again. Now we have everything in common. Toys, books. Dad says he loves us equally. Don't cry. Here, take this candy. It's actually my favourite, but I'll give it to you. Eat it. Lee smiled, wiped away his tears and Thomas sighed with relief. He had doubted until the end whether such a shock therapy was necessary for the children. After all, they were too little. But at that moment, he realized it was not in vain. The man smiled and said, Well, kids, let's say goodbye to our loved ones and let them rest in peace. 
I suggest we cheer up a bit. Go feed the ducks at the pond. Take a walk and eat ice cream. Who's in? The kids were happy and hurried to leave the cemetery because it was so sad and even scary there. Just don't tell Grandma about where we were, Thomas added. Let's not upset her. Let it be our secret. And about the ice cream too, because someone's throat hurt recently. They spent the whole day together, sailing paper boats, and Thomas taught the kids how to throw stones beautifully with a flip into the water. In the evening, they all ate a delicious dinner cooked by Madeline and talked about their adventures. The woman asked quietly, Thomas, how did you manage that? The kids became like siblings. Where did the jealousy go? I should knock on wood so as not to jinx it. Thomas laughed sadly. I just talked to them honestly and they heard me. After all, we're raising smart kids. The passions at home subsided and Thomas decided to put things in order in his company. He bought several video cameras and installed them in the deputy's office, in the common smoking room and in the reception area. The businessman wanted to make sure and catch Hugh so he wouldn't wriggle out. No one knew about the cameras and that was the point. A week had passed and Thomas intentionally went to the office on Saturday when no one else was there to look through the recordings. And then his hair stood on end. Hugh, with his leg crossed and lounging in his chair, was chatting on the phone with someone. Don't shout, don't worry, everything will be fine. Our fool Thomas suspects nothing. I'll give him these papers in a few days. He'll sign them without a second thought. Do you know how many documents he signs in a day? So one more or less won't be noticed. And as soon as his signature is on there, it's a done deal. We'll make it look like the fool himself sold his store in the city centre at a throwaway price. That's it. And if anything goes wrong, we'll put it all on his secretary, Carrie. We'll say the stupid woman typed the document wrong. It's not the first time. Everything went smoothly with the accountant, Barbara. And it will work out here too. So, you owe us a bottle of Dom Perignon. Thomas realised that he had signed a whole stack of papers without looking at them just yesterday. Oh, what a fool he was. Did he really sell the store without even realising it? The man rushed to the reception area, searched through everything, but couldn't find the document he was looking for. He was almost in tears, and then he thought to turn on the camera recording in the reception area. It showed Carrie calling Paul, the purchasing manager. Paul, come here. Everything is just as you said. I've hidden the sales agreement, so come and get it to keep it safe. Otherwise, Mr. Flynn will soon be looking for it. But as soon as Paul took the agreement and left, the deputy director came in abruptly. Carrie, is the director here? Did he sign today's papers? Can I get mine? The girl, as if nothing had happened, answered, Yes, of course. They're all in the blue folder. Hugh Flynn searched through everything and got angry, not finding the paper he was looking for. He yelled in a voice that wasn't his own. Carrie, it's not all here. I urgently need one document. Did you take everything from his desk? Or as usual, are you in the clouds? The girl calmly answered. Don't yell at me. I took everything that was there. If your document isn't there, maybe the director is still reviewing it. Do you want me to ask him? What's the name of the document? But the deputy just grumbled. No need, he's reviewing it. I'll come back on Monday. Thomas breathed a sigh of relief and immediately called Paul. I know everything, Paul. How did you know it was fake? The man happily replied. Because I've been working for you for ten years. And I know you wouldn't sell the best store in the city centre for a few pennies. So Carrie and I confiscated that document, and I was going to bring it to you on Monday. And then you can decide what to do with it. Thomas was furious. I think it's time for Hugh to be punished for all his tricks. It turns out he's done this before, and an innocent person suffered and died because of him. A child was left without a mother, 
and he didn't care at all. The scoundrel will get what he deserves. And to you, Paul, thanks a lot. And you know what? Get ready to be my deputy. I need loyal people like you, and I'll give Carrie a raise. Thank you, guys, from the bottom of my heart. On Monday, Thomas took all his evidence to the prosecutor's office, and the deputy director finally answered for his crimes. He had been under investigation for a long time, trying in every way to avoid punishment. However, his jokes with the prosecutor did not help him, and the braggart did not get away with it. Barbara's last will was fulfilled, and Hugh Flynn received a real sentence. Now he would experience prison life and learn the cost of his misdeed. In fact, it was not only Barbara who suffered and died because of him, but also Thomas's brother. He wanted to save his wife so much that he fell asleep at the wheel. If it weren't for this whole story, the family would have lived peacefully and raised Lee. Three months have passed and the family was living together. The children got along and were friends. However, one day, while the grandmother wasn't watching, two young scouts decided that they were already old enough to walk home from school alone. They didn't wait for the grandmother and, deceiving the teacher, left on their own. On the way, they decided to feed the ducks at the pond in the park themselves. They had bread in their backpacks. Jenny got so carried away that she approached the edge too closely. The ground crumbled and she tumbled into the water. It was October outside and the water was cold. The girl couldn't swim, panicked and started to drown. Lee threw off his backpack, tore off his jacket and with a cry of, Hang on little sister, rushed into the water. Unlike his sister, the boy could swim well and by the time people gathered, he had managed to pull Jenny to shore. Passers-by called an ambulance, and the children were taken to hospital. I'm going to give them a good scolding, both of them. Thomas was swearing on the way. How could they deceive the teacher like that? Leave on their own? Scare you and me like that? Madeline just moaned and held onto her heart. Oh, Tommy, don't be too hard on them. Who didn't misbehave in their childhood? Just a little scolding for prevention. Jenny was sitting with Lee in the hospital pyjamas, and they were whispering about something. Seeing her father's menacing face, Jenny jumped up bravely. Daddy, don't scold Lee. It was all my fault, so punish me. But then Lee burst out from behind her back and started gibbering. Uncle Thomas, I am a man, so I am to blame. It was my stupid idea to go to the pond. She had nothing to do with it. Forgive us. We were so scared ourselves. Jenny continued, not letting him get a word in. You know, Daddy, Lee saved me. I was screaming and drowning and he dragged me to the shore, didn't let me die. So now he's definitely my real brother. Thomas's heart warmed up as he saw how friendly the children had become and how much they loved each other. He changed his mind about scolding them and instead sat on the bed, putting them both on their knees. Oh my God, Granny and I were so worried about you. You're my silly children. Promise me you'll never do this again. And apologize to your teacher. She'll be furious with you. Remember, lying is not good. You should listen to adults. And Lee, well done. A real hero. You didn't hesitate, jumped into the cold water and saved your sister. But next time, it's better to call adults. A pleasant, middle-aged female doctor entered the room, looked sternly through her glasses and said, Ah, so the dad has finally shown up. Well, let's talk. Tell me, how did you lose track of the children? Jenny and Lee immediately started chattering. Dr. Livingston, don't scold Dad. It's not his fault. And Granny too. It's all our fault. Scold us. The woman involuntarily smiled. Such a close-knit family everyone covering for each other. I've never seen anything like it. Thomas listened to the doctor but couldn't take his eyes off her. She was so charming and charismatic that he was immediately drawn to her. Although she tried to be strict, her eyes were kind and radiant, making it clear that she loved children. Dr. Livingston kept adjusting the lock of hair that was sticking out. 
from under her medical cap and squinting. And where is the children's mother? she asked in the end. Why didn't she come? Thomas sighed. I've been a widower for seven years now. My wife died during childbirth, and I'm raising my daughter myself. And Lee is my nephew. He recently lost his own parents. Now I'm raising him too, and I want to adopt him. Don't think I'm irresponsible. Work takes up a lot of time, and their granny always comes to look after the children. The school is not far away. The kids are good. But today they decided to show off, and therefore they got into trouble. Are they really okay? The water in the pond is cold. Dr Livingston looked at the man completely differently. An hour ago she was outraged. How could he let seven-year-old children go to the pond alone? And now she was admiring him. He was raising two children on his own. Not every woman is capable of that, let alone a man. Besides, Thomas also caught her eye. He was polite and intelligent. Mary Livingston had been divorced for a long time. God didn't give her children, and her husband kept reproaching her for it and drinking heavily. Suddenly, she suggested, If you like, take the kids home as an exception. I've examined them and they're fine, and tomorrow I'll drop by to you on my way home and listen to their lungs one more time just in case. Thomas smiled broadly. He himself was hesitant to leave, but didn't know how to start a conversation. So, he agreed with pleasure. Thank you for your understanding, Dr. Livingston. We'll definitely be waiting for you tomorrow. The next day, Thomas cancelled all his appointments, didn't go to work, and spent the whole day in the kitchen. The children stayed home too. Dr. Livingston arrived close to five o'clock. Thomas greeted her with chatter and bustle. Good afternoon, please come in. We just finished cooking some chicken stew. Would you like to have lunch with us? You look so beautiful. Dr. Livingston blushed, as no one had complimented her in years. Thank you. I won't refuse. I've been on my feet all day, and haven't even had a poppy seed in my mouth. Well, where are my patients? I'll go examine them. Jenny and Lee were happy to see the doctor. They immediately liked this pleasant, smiling woman. She exuded calmness and kindness. Everything was fine with the children. Everyone sat down to eat, and Mary enjoyed the delicious stew. Thomas, you're outstanding. You raise your children, cook so well, and have a business. Are you a human? Madeline smiled quietly. The children giggled, and Thomas, and Thomas blushed. Unfortunately, despite all my achievements, we still lack a lady of the house and a mother to the children, he replied, and after a second added, Mary, would you like to take a walk in the park on the weekend? We already have a tradition of walking there, feeding the ducks in the pond, and the children roller skate. Or are you busy? Mary's heart was ready to jump out of her chest, and she answered too quickly, You know, I think I'll agree. I haven't walked around for ages. It's all work and home. I'll be happy to join you. Are you okay if I bring my dog? His name is Baron. He's a poodle. Otherwise, he'll be lonely at home. The children happily shouted. Of course, bring Baron. Does he know any commands? We'll play ball then. The guest left, and Jenny suddenly said, looking slyly at her father, Daddy? You should take a closer look at Dr. Livingston. She doesn't have a ring on her finger. Everyone laughed together, and Thomas thought, why not? After all, what if it's fate? <laughs>